Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Behind the Code. Um, in this week's episode, we're going to be talking all about Google Tag Manager for mobile apps. My name is Andrew Wales. I'm on the Analytics Developer Relations team. Uh, and with me in the studio today is uh, Neil Rhodes. He's the tech lead on Google Tag Manager for mobile apps. Um, Neil, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I look forward to doing this. Great. Um, so Google Tag Manager for mobile apps launched publicly a couple weeks ago now, I think? It was in August, yes. August, OK. Um, and beyond doing um, all of the very nice kind of flexible tagging of analytics uh, tools and conversion tools, as uh, you might know that GTM does on the web, um, there's actually a lot in uh, GTM Tag Manager for mobile apps that's uh, really designed to make uh, life a lot simpler for app developers as well. So I'm excited to have you here and kind of go through um, everything that's available for um, all of you app, de uh, app developers to take advantage of. Um, so let's take a quick look uh, at what's on tap. Um, Neil's going to give you a quick overview of sort of what uh, Tag Manager for mobile is uh, designed to do and what problems it's designed to help you solve. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you can work with the SDK, um, how you do some of the sort of core things you need to do with it. And we'll show you some code snippets there as well just to make things more clear. Uh, we'll talk about containers, macros, rules, and tags. Um, and these four uh, sort of, these are the four kind of building blocks in GTM. These, these are the things you're going to be working with uh, in the web interface. Um, and just so you know where to go, we'll also walk you through the web interface, how to use that to do some of the very basic tasks when you're working with GTM and your containers. Um, and then lastly, I'll show you guys some resources um, that you can use after the GDL um, to go check out uh, more information and get started with GTM as well. Cool, so let's get started. Uh, we'll start at a very high level. Um, just give, give everyone who's not already familiar with uh, GTM for mobile apps uh, an idea of what this is all about. Um, so Neil, can you, can you give us kind of an overview of what are the problems that uh, Tag Manager for mobile apps was designed to solve? Sure. So a big problem with mobile apps is, unlike, let's say, a web application, a mobile application is really frozen. So you ship the application. Until you ship a new version, it maintains its behavior and appearance. And that's part of what DTM for mobile apps addresses. So the idea is you can, normally what happens is you ship a new version. In order to ship a new version, you've got to secure approvals, either from your own people or also from application stores. You've then got an upgrade cycle where people may or may not be upgrading. And so out in the field, you've got a lot of different versions. You're not quite sure what versions you have. What happens with GTM is we actually go ahead and have a single representation of configuration information that's stored up in the web, and that gets downloaded to each container. So once you want to make a change, that'll get downloaded to your application, and then your application has access to these new values pretty much immediately. Okay, so what are the sorts of things you might want to configure? Well, the first thing is you've got to actually write your application so that it is highly configurable. So if you've got things like uh, how often you want to show an ad, where you want to show an ad, a host you need to talk to on a back end, or a timeout in talking to that host, if you have a game, how many uh, points do you get when you kill a bad guy, uh, any URLs for help or something else, all of that's configurable. And really, you just need to make sure that in your application, you have an API call to get that value. So you pass in a string, you get back a value. And the key point that GTM for mobile apps provides is you're always getting the latest and greatest value, not what's just locked into the application. As well, GTM also provides tagging, uh, like its name says. So Google Tag Manager for web was intended or provides the ability to do tagging. That is, do things like analytics calls, or AdWords conversion calls, or third-party type calls. And you just have to tag your pages once, and then you can go ahead and make changes using GTM and have those effect. The same thing is sort of true on applications. So what you do is you add to your application calls when anything interesting is happening in your application. And then there's this level of indirection so that later on, you can go ahead and say, when this particular thing happens, I want to go ahead and make an analytics call. Or when this happens, I want to make an AdWords conversion tracking call. Or when this happens, I want to ping this particular URL. So hit this particular URL. So that's really the universal analytics, the AdWords conversion tracking, and then these custom image tags. As we'll see later on, there's also the possibility of having just a custom function that gets executed. So you 
have a call that happens in your application based on rules that you specified after the fact. Great, so let's talk about working with the uh, Tag Manager SDK. And actually this is part of the uh, Analytics Services SDK, which is Tag Manager and uh, Google Analytics combined into one package. Right. Um, so can you tell us, maybe we'll walk through um, some of the basic tasks that you're going to want to do with the SDK, opening a container, uh, getting configuration values, uh, pushing data the day, la uh, the day later, excuse me, and also uh, previewing a container would be great. Sure. Well, what we've tried to do is make this really as simple as possible. So first, initialization. Well, um, the first thing you do is actually just get the tag manager. So tag manager or get instance. And from there, then, you need to open a particular container. So a container is these collections of macros, tags, and rules. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But it's identified by a particular container ID of the form GTM dash some four, five, or six character sequence. So the first thing you do is open your container. All right? And you just provide the container ID. You can provide a timeout, although if you don't provide one, a default is going to be used. That doesn't actually return. So let's make clear what happens. When you are first running your app for the very first time, there's been no communication to the web. So you run your application, and it needs to actually go to the web to get the current version of the container. Now, we don't know how long that's going to take, right? And we also don't even know whether they're connected to the, to the network. So what we do is when you call open saved, you, we return what's called a future. That is, in the background, it's going to be going through and doing its network communication so that we don't stall while we're waiting to open the container. While that's going on, you could do additional initialization of your application. And then when you're ready and need, actually need a container value, you'll call containerfuture.get, and that will, if necessary, wait until the download has happened. Okay. Once you have a container, four basic calls. Okay. You can get long, get string, get double, or get boolean. You provide a string, and it gives you back something of the same type. Okay. So if you have specified, for instance, your timeout for talking to a backend host, timeout in milliseconds, call container to get long, and that'll return that value. Okay. The latest and greatest value that has been set up uh, on, the, on the website. One thing just to point out about that actually, when you're calling get long or any of these get calls, there's no network communication happening. So the network communication has already happened, and we downloaded the entire container, and now we're just doing local calls. So these are not terribly expensive calls. Okay. If you run your application and there is no network connection, so let's say, in fact, you've never connected, your, your user has never connected to the network, what value should be used for this? Right? You don't want to force that your application has to be connected to the network the first time you run. So therefore, there's a default container. And the default container is a JSON file, or uh, you can also create your container on the website and just download it and use that binary format. And that has initial values for all of your keys that you've set up that you want to be getting the values of. So that way, when you ship your application, you're shipping not just the application, you're also shipping this default container. And that way, your application can run as is without any network connection. Once you make a network connection, so once a network connection happens, and we download a newer version of the container, that newer version of the container will be used until there's an even newer version of the container. All right? And what happens is the application or the SDK will check twice a day to try and get and see if there's a, even a newer version. So normally, as long as there's a network connection, you're no more than 12 hours out of date. The final calls you want to make, so the first ones we just saw are all you need to do from within your application to access these configuration values. The next thing you also want to do is tagging. And tags are executed in response to interesting things happening in your application. How do you specify an interesting thing happening? You push to the data layer. So the data layer is a collection of values okay, which you can write to and which then the GTM runtime can actually have access to. The data layer is used for two things. So the first thing it's used for is just to provide interesting runtime information. As an example, you might want to provide how many times does the user run this application? 
if you might want to have some rule based on that. Okay? Or what's the uh, user's lifetime value? Again, so that later on you can have rules to deal with that. And then the second thing you use the data layer for is pushing events. So an event is a map of values, one of which has the name event. That's really what makes it different from any other data layer push. And then you, once an event is pushed, any associated tags that uh, have been registered for that event will get executed. As an example, then, you might want to push an event here when you open a screen. So every time you go to a new screen or new activity, when you open a dialog, something like that, push an event that says this is happening. You can add additional data, as we have here, like which screen name is it. And that'll be useful then when you get to the actual tag so that you can specify that screen name. This is also a cheap call. So pushing to the data layer is quite inexpensive. If there are no tags that have rules associated with that event, it's a very simple and easy call. So you can afford to push data layer events really anytime anything interesting is happening in your application. Everything else really happens on the web side as you're editing your container and creating rules, tags, and macros. Now one thing that happens, let's say you make a change on the website to update your container values. All right? How do you know they're right? You don't really want to go publish that container live to the world without testing it. And so the way to test it is by previewing. The way preview happens is on the website, you say, I want to preview the container, and it'll give you then a URL. And you go to that URL on a device, and you can see how would this application act if this particular version of the container were to be the published version. So that's useful for you to do debugging. It's useful if you hand off to someone, like a product manager, who wants to say, what's this going to look like if I turn on these values? And you can show them. And finally, it's also useful for application stores Right? If you're going through a review process, you may want to show them, look, here's my initial version of the application, and I have these other uh, UI alternatives that I may be turning on. Okay? And let me give you a URL to show you what those, UR, U, um, those different UI alternatives look like. So that way you don't have any hidden features that you're trying to somehow sneak by uh, uh, an app store. In order to preview a container, you do need a little additional code. So in your uh, main XML file, you will need to add an activity that basically specifies when a certain URL occurs, go execute this preview activity. There's something similar that happens on iOS as well. Once you're in the website, you've chosen the version of the container, made your changes, and then say you want to preview it, it will go ahead and generate a URL okay, along with a QR code. And then you can just go to your device and scan that UR code or enter the URL. And then, as I say, your application, from then on until your application exits, will be using that version of the container rather than the published version of the container. Let's talk a bit about containers, tags, rules, and macros. And Neil, you've mentioned each of these a couple times now in talking about um, how you might want to configure your application uh, to receive sort of updated configuration values or to fire tags, for example, when you're pushing events to the data layer. Um, so let's walk through each of these four. Maybe you can give us some more details about what exactly containers, tags, rules, and macros are. I'd be happy to. So a container is a collection of these values. The idea is you would normally have one container for a website uh, or one container for an application. So if you publish three different applications, you'd probably want to have a container separate for each one. It's possible to have multiple containers for an application, but that's a, not a very common occurrence. Okay? So a container has a container ID associated with it. And as you remember, when we initialized our container, we provided that ID and then got back that uh, container on, uh, on the device. For mobile, again, these containers are updated twice a day. So when your application first starts, it looks, sees the version, uh, what version of the container it has and how old it is, and then go goes and talks to 
backend server to see whether there's a new version. If there is a new version, it downloads it. If not, it waits. 12 hours later, it'll try and do that again. Tags, as I mentioned, are evaluated when you push an event to the data layer. Okay, that's the only time tags ever fire, is when events are pushed to the data layer. And they're only pushed to the data layer when you've got a rule that associates a particular tag with a particular event. Examples of tags include Google Analytics tracking. What does this mean? Well, this means you can actually take your mobile application and get rid of all the explicit Google Analytics calls. Okay? Instead, you want to have pushes to the, of events to the data layer. And then, in the UI, you're going to set up, when this event happens, I want this GA call to happen. That's a tag. As well, there are AdWords conversion remarketing tags in the same way. So this removes the requirement for having to have explicit GA calls and then a new SDK and explicit AdWords and conversion tracking calls. Instead, you have a unified model where all you're doing is pushing events to the data layer, and then you have a separate place in the UI where you're associating as you want those events with particular tags, be it GA, be it AdWords. Other possibility, maybe you have some backend that you're using, and you want particular URLs to be hit when certain things happen in your application. That's the idea of a custom image. So you're actually, in the UI, building up a URL, and that URL is going to be uh, retrieved, we'll do an HTTP GET on that URL, again, when an event occurs that matches the rule for that tag. Finally, you can just have arbitrary code executed. So you can actually, in your application, register with the tag manager to say when a, uh, you're writing a particular function associated with a particular function name. And so that can cause then this indirection where you push an event to the data layer, you have a rule associated with a particular function tag that calls back into your application, and then you can do something custom. Unlike on the web, tags in applications can't be executed synchronously. That is, we can't actually do the HTTP GET necessarily immediately. And the reason for that is your application may be running without any network connectivity. So, in, in all three of these first cases where we're dealing with URLs, the URL doesn't actually get uh, retrieved until we actually have network access. So what happens is these URLs get queued, and then we go ahead and, uh, about 15 minutes later, go ahead and, re and retrieve those. Okay? Part of the advantage of that is better battery usage, because we're clumping together multiple tags and retrieving those all at once, rather than doing that, let's say, once every five minutes. Macros are name value pairs. All right? And their values are their determinant runtime. It's easy to see with some predefined macros. So one macro, for instance, is the language the user has set. Another is the version of the operating system. Another is the platform. That is, are we on iOS? Are we on Android? So these are values that can be retrieved at runtime and for which you can write rules against. So you can write rules against them, and you can also use any of these macros within a tag. Okay. We have another important predefined macro, is a data layer macro. So this says actually, I want to retrieve a value from the data layer. So that provides a way to write a rule that retrieves data from your application. So as long as your application has put it in the data layer, you can have a macro then that retrieves it from the data layer. Value collection macros are special in that they are the way that we have these configuration values that are accessible at runtime. So when you on your container call get string uh, or get boolean, what we're looking for are macros in the uh, value collection. And we define basically JSON. So we have multiple key value pairs all in a hierarchy. Just like we had the function tag 
where you have custom code in your application that executes in response to pushing a particular event. Similarly, we have function macros, which are custom code that executes for a particular macro you've registered. So you register you want to handle some particular kind, and then when that kind happens, it'll call back into your application, and it'll ask for a value. And then finally, what really puts it all together are the rules. So you specify rules for when value collections are going to be active. It's an example you might want to, well, we'll see an example when we, when we look at our, our UI overview, where you might have one value if you're on a particular uh, version of the operating system and another value in a different version. What rules get to do is test macro values. So you can do both numeric comparisons as well as string comparisons, like regexes and so on. For a given tag, you can specify it will execute if any of these rules are true, and as long as none of these other rules are true. Okay, so you can have both enabling and disabling, or allowing and blocking rules. And one follow-up question, Neil, um, about function tags. So it gives you the ability to, um, based on some event that's pushed into the data layer, so something interesting happens in the app, it lets you then create a rule that says, uh, you know, when this event occurs, I want to call this particular function. That's right. But when you do that, you're actually calling back into the app. You're not actually providing uh, code via the web interface that's going to That's run. a good point. So yeah, when you have a uh, function tag, what's happening is the code has to be in your application already. So you have to have prepared your application to have this custom function. An example of where you might want to have this custom function would be, let's say you have a third-party SDK that does some other form of tracking that GTM doesn't currently support. Okay? So you could go ahead and have a custom function that calls into that third-party SDK. Right, right. And then you can write rules just as you, as you normally would for GA. Right, right. So it's a way, that would be a way to extend it. So not just if you're not using uh, GA or if you want to use something else, you could use these function tags to launch that. Exactly. Cool. Cool. So let's actually take a look at the web interface where you're going to be creating um, all of these containers, uh, macros, tags, and rules. Um, so Neil, I think you can give us a little run through on the UI if we can switch to your screen. Sure, I'd be happy to. So well, google.com Google slash tag manager is where we're at. And I'm going to go ahead. I've already created an, an account. I'm going to create a container. So containers all have names. This is just for your use. Uh, I'm going to call it. Uh, our GDL demo. And as you can see, there are two different kinds of containers, those for web pages and those for mobile apps. We, of course, are interested in mobile apps here. And we're going to go ahead and have this container support both Android and iOS. Now, you can share a container between your iOS and your Android app, and you would want to do so if they are fairly similar to each other. If they're using completely different sorts of tagging and different sorts of configuration values, then you really want to have two separate containers. In this case, we're going to use one. And you can see we can now download the SDK. Okay. As Andrew mentioned, it's a combined Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager SDK. I don't need to do that right now because we're just looking at the UI. And we can now configure the container. So in fact, let's just look at what the container has already. It has a rule, always, which is basically a rule that's always true, and then a bunch of macros for all sort of the built-in things like finding out the application ID, the name of the app, the version, uh, finding out what device name we are on, um, the language, ID for advertising, um, and uh, resolutions, and so on. What I'd like to do is create a new macro. Okay. I want to do some configuration to be able, in my application, to be able to, let's say, get a uh, string. Okay, so this is going to be my configuration values. And I'm going to create a value collection. In this value collection, we're going to have, so what are we going to be customizing? Well, actually, let's not get a string. Let's get a Boolean. So I've got a new UI element that I want to be able to display. So enable my new UI feature. And we're going to set that to be false, because we don't want people to actually see this new UI feature, UI feature yet. And then we also have a backend timeout value 
for a backend server we talked to of 2,000 milliseconds. Okay. So this specifies a value collection. However, we need to also specify rules for it. Okay. If we don't specify any rules, it won't have any effect. I'm going to go ahead and create an enabling rule, which says it's always true, okay. and then save this. So as I look at my overview, I can see I now have my configuration values, and I can see what I have set up. What's the next thing to do? Create a version, and I can go ahead and publish it. So that means that my application out there will now be using this value. Okay. Let's create a modification of this. Okay. Let's actually make it so it's targeted as to when this feature is on or off. So I'm going to create a macro. Let's call this, you know, enable UI feature. Uh, let's disable it on iOS. Okay, and we'll enable it on Android. So I'm going to go ahead and set this. Let's see, on iOS to be false. And when is this going to be true? This is going to be true on iOS. I don't have a rule for iOS, but I can create one. And what I can do is look at the platform. So if the platform is equal to iOS, then that rule is true. And if this rule is true, this macro is going to be true. And therefore, it's going to be used, I should say. And I want to create also a version of this for Android. So enabled on Android. So enable the UI feature. And this was, and I have to make sure to get this right, enable UI feature. When do we want this to be true? Well, we want this to be true only in Android. We could write a separate on Android rule, or we can take advantage of the disabling rules. So we can say it's always going to be true, except we're disabling it when it's on iOS. Okay. So we now have enable the UI feature on iOS and enable the UI feature on Android. And you can see here, I've spelled one of them wrong. One is enable my new UI feature, and one is just enable UI feature. So I better go edit that to make sure. They're the same. And the last change we want to make is we actually have some overlap right now. So enable my new UI feature, if we're on iOS, is going to be false due to this macro, but it's actually going to be true due to my configuration values. And we really don't want to multiply specify it. So we just want to re remove it from here. OK, so what do we have set up? Now back-end timeout is going to be 2,000 on all platforms. Enable my new UI feature is going to be false on iOS. And it's going to be true on anything but iOS. In this case, that's just Android. OK, so let's go ahead and look at creating a tag to call Google Analytics when a new screen occurs. That is, when we have an event for tracking a screen. OK, so this is going to be, let's say, our GA screen view. And we're going to use Universal Analytics. We need to provide a course for Google Analytics, the tracking ID. I'm, of course, not putting in a real tracking ID here. And what do we want to do? We want the tracking type. So again, this is just from Universal Analytics. What are the different types of things that you can track? In our case, we're going to track an app view. And what do we want to track? Well, we want to provide the app name. Rather than typing in the app name here, it's a little more flexible to go ahead and use the pre-existing macro for the app name that's going to get it uh, from the actual APK. Similarly for app version. Now the screen name, where do we get that? Right? That's not a fixed value. If you remember, when we pushed to the data layer, we pushed a map containing 
event mapped to open screen and screen name mapped to whatever the name of the screen was. So we actually want from the data layer a screen name value. That's not predefined. We're going to have to create it. So we can have a data layer value here, and this is going to be the screen name. And this name here, the later variable name, that's exactly the name that we use when we push the event. So we've set up what the tag's going to look like. We're going to be doing an app view tag, and it's going to have the app name, app version, and screen name. And that's all we really need. However, now we need a rule, when do we fire this? Okay. Do we want it always? No, that would say on every single event that gets pushed to the data layer, this would fire. And that's not really appropriate. We don't want an iOS, we need a new rule. Okay. So this is going to be you know, on a uh, open screen event. Okay. So how do we tell an open screen event? Well, that is if the event is equal to open screen. And again, open screen was the name that we used when we actually pushed the data layer event. Okay. So your application was going to call um, the data layer push. It'll be pushing an event called open screen with a screen name called home screen. This rule is going to make sure that this tag gets fired, and the screen name data layer macro is going to pull its screen name from that pushed value. All right. So from here, we can create a version, and we could publish it. But as I mentioned, let's say we are, want to test it first. So we can go ahead and use preview. And here, we know the name of the application. This name has to match what is in your XML file that was associated with setting up the preview activity. Okay, so I'm going to just call it my app for right now, and it generates a preview link. So basically, what we need to do in the device is go to this link, or alternatively, scan this QR code, and that will then start using this version of the container we just created that has the extra tag and also has this differential UI feature based on whether we're on iOS or on Android. Once we're happy with it, then we can go ahead and publish. Okay. The last thing I want to show you is download here. So download is actually going to download this version of the container. And this can then be used as your default container. So not only can you have a default container that just contains values, you can also have a default container that contains values, tags, rules, macros, the whole shebang. I think that's an important point because if you have um, rules set up, for example, or, or tags, and you want to um, have a default container that has all those things, then you should use the binary version. Obviously, the JSON version is not going to be sufficient in that case. Yeah, the JSON version might be OK if you just have configuration type values. Right. But mm -hmm. if you're doing tagging, then you probably really do want to go ahead and have an initial set of tags that are pre-configured in your application. Mm -hmm. And then you can always go ahead and override those by going to the UI. Great. So um, that brings us towards the end of the program. Um, I did want to pass off some resources um, to you guys. But before we get to that, I just want to quickly recap um, what we talked about, because Neil just ran through a, a whole bunch of information. Um, and I want to make sure that it's, it's not lost on anybody how um, powerful this stuff can be. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, being able to push configuration values to your app um, via this web interface. Uh, and Neil, that, that basically means that you can um, actually update your app in the wild, in the hands of users, in it's under 12 hours, right? That's right. And that's, it's far, you know, that's much quicker than having to rebuild the app, resubmit it for review, and then follow that long tail out of where, you know, adoption as people decide to update the app or not. Exactly. On that point, is, is there any, um, I, some people might be wondering, does this cause any issues if you're getting, you know, uh, when you submit your app to be approved or reviewed and approved by, um, you know, Google or Apple or somebody else, does this cause any issues to have this kind of a logic um, with Tag Manager? 
You mentioned the preview URLs for one way to. Yeah, that's that. really the way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. We do not recommend that you have inside your application uh, different features or different UI that's sort of hidden behind a flag mm -hmm. that you don't tell the you know uh, particular like right. Google or Apple about. Right. So and the way to expose that and allow them to look at it is really with these preview links. Right. So you could actually have multiple preview links if you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you have five different features, let's say, right. and you might go ahead and have five different preview links and just say, here's these things that w could be exposed in the future, or even tell them when they when they would be exposed. Cool. And then when you're ready to make them go live, it's just enabling it in the interface, and that's pretty much it. That's it. It's very cool. Um, the other thing we talked about, not just getting configuration values um, from the web, but also um, tagging. Um, so you can create these tags um, that will basically, uh, when interesting things happen in the app, you can sort of have this layer of indirection, which you, which you called it, Neil, where you push the events into the data layer, and then you decide what you want to do when those events get fired. So maybe you want to fire uh, some analytics uh, tags, or maybe you want to um, track an AdWords conversion, and so forth. Um, Maybe one question I know some people might be wondering, uh, and you talked about it a little bit, but can you um, sort of, obviously there's going to be some people who are uneasy about the idea of um, it being, might slow down the application, for example, to be pushing things into the data layer, um, or even just refreshing the container in general. Uh, they mm -hmm. might be concerned when the app starts up, you know, how long is that going to take? Is it going to block? Um, what if I have UI? values that I need right away, and I don't want to see like the screen shifting in front of anybody as the values change or anything like that. Can you just speak generally to um, anybody's performance concerns? Sure. So there are a couple aspects. Um, so let's start with the sort of easier ones first. Yeah, sure. um, so getting a value, when you make a get call, get string, or so on, those are really very fast. Mm -hmm. All they're doing is uh, evaluating a subset of small rules. And, and then figuring out what to do, mm -hmm. okay, and returning that. <coughs> Pushing to the data layer is also relatively quick uh, in that first it's just looking and seeing, does this particular, well, first off, if there's no event, nothing gets executed. Right. S well, no spe specific extra code executed. Mm -hmm. It writes to a data layer, which is a very simple in-memory data structure. Okay. If it's an event, we look and see, are there any tags associated with that, for which we have to kind of figure out the rules and so on. Mm -hmm. And if so, same simple rule evaluation. And then tag execution is fairly quick. So it's not, for instance, like our tags are synchronously waiting and trying to send over the network. Right, right. Okay, Really, we just quickly store it, and then later on in a separate thread that's going to be sent. How long do those stay queued up? So if, if the device doesn't have connection, um, a couple tags are fired. We, mm -hmm. we queue up those requests. Um, and then if someone were to, for example, close the app and restart it, would it then make those requests, or are they gone after the app is closed? So a couple different answers. Yeah, the, okay. the, the short answer is no, they, they do stay, stay there. So okay. we save them in a persistent storage. Mm -hmm. And when the application reopens, then we would try to resend them again. It's not even so bad than that, as that on Android, because on Android, your application, even when you leave the application, it's normally still running in the background. And so those hits should still be sent. Okay. It's only if your application actually forcibly quit, which if you're short of memory or something like that, right. that we would then have to wait until the next time the application okay. uh, was run. As far as the container opening, you really have to decide how much your, uh, how important it is, for one thing, that you get the current version of the container mm -hmm. before you display your UI. Right. Okay. One possibility, and we have an example for this, is have a splash screen. So have a quick splash screen that then can you can do all of your initialization, including container initialization. And once the container is there, you can continue forward. Right. In some extreme examples, you might say, if I can't get a container from the network, you know, I don't want to run. That would be an extreme case. Yeah. Um, if you're just using your container for things like host names or values or things like that, you probably want to go ahead and issue the request to get the container and then continue on your way. And when it comes in, you'll get those values. And if not, you'll revert to the default. Right. Okay. Right. If you've got a UI issue where, for instance, you have a complete new UI based on the version of the container, that's the case where you probably want to wait mm -hmm. because it would look kind of funny to use the default version 
which might have UI version A. And then when the container actually downloads and says to use version B, you suddenly start switching version B. I see. So yeah. I think that's the flashing you talked about. But that's uh, it's kind of important to notice that you could actually ship a whole new UI um, by pushing all these updated configuration values. I mean, it kind of speaks to the power of the product that you could actually do that. Well, so yes and no. In in you're the one that's having to do it in your application, yeah. right? So you. If you have two different versions of your of your UI, maybe all it is is you just have a boolean that you're sending down, and you right. have a lot of code there. Right. On the other hand, you could also make it fairly configurable and send down all sorts of information, like what belongs on a particular screen or how it's laid out. Mm -hmm. It could be quite configurable mm -hmm. done remotely. Cool. So the Google Analytics app, in fact, takes advantage of that. The mobile application, mm -hmm. they go ahead and have a very configurable information they send down via GTM. Cool. And they can add new reports, remove reports, modify reports, all using GTM. And it'll just affect all of the applications in the wild. That's cool. And in about 12 hours or so. That's right. Yeah, Very cool. Awesome. Um, well, I think that brings us to the end of the time. Um, just a few resources. Um, obviously, if you want to just get started with the product, you can just go right to it. It's google.com slash tag manager. We also have getting started guides for Android and iOS. Uh, a lot of the examples we gave today and a lot of the code we showed was specific to Android, but there are equivalents for everything that we showed um, for iOS as well. Um, so you can find those guides on the developer site. Other than that, thank you for joining us uh, talking this week about Google Tag Manager for mobile, uh, and we'll catch you next time.